to do with that so boy you liked? Yes, I like you once. I came across his picture a while ago. Oh, he gave you his picture? No, it's in the yearbook. Oh, a high school boy. Yes, his name is Jim. Here he is in the Pirates of Penzance. The, the what? The operetta the senior class put on. He had a wonderful voice. And he sat across the aisle for me in the yard every Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Here he is with the silver cup and debating. See his grin? Oh, he must have had a jolly disposition. He used to call me Blue Roses. Why did he call you such a name as that? When I was out a little while with chlorosis, when I came back, he asked me what was the matter. I told him I had chlorosis. He thought I said Blue Roses. So that's what he always called me after that. Whenever he'd see me, he'd holler, Hello, Blue Roses! I didn't care much for the girl he went out with, Emily Meisenbach. Emily was the best dress girl that sold him. She never struck me though to be sincere. It says in the personal section they're engaged. That's six years ago. They must be married by now. Well, usually girls that aren't cut out for business careers end up married to some nice man. <clears throat> Sister, that's what you'll do. <laughs> but mother. You never say you're crippled. You just have a slight defect, hardly even noticeable. Except when people have a slight disadvantage like that, they learn to cultivate other things to make up for it, like uh, charm and vivacity and charm. It's one thing your father had plenty of was charm. <laughs> After the fiasco of Rubicon's business college, the idea of getting a gentleman caller for Laura began to play a more, more important part in mother's calculations. It became an obsession. Like some archetype of the universal unconscious, the image of the gentleman caller haunted her small apartment. An evening at home rarely passed without some allusion to this image, this specter, this hope. Even when he wasn't mentioned, his presence hung in mother's preoccupied look and in my sister's frightened, apologetic manner. Hung like a sentence passed upon the wing fields. Mother was a woman of action as well as words. Late that winter and in the early spring, realizing that extra money would be needed to properly feather the nest and plume the bird, she conducted a vigorous campaign on the telephone. Roping in subscribers to one of those magazines for matrons called The Homemaker's Companion. The type of journal that features the serialized sublimations of ladies of letters who think in terms of delicate, cup like breasts, slim, tapering waists, rich, creamy thighs, eyes like wood smoke in autumn, fingers that soothe and caress like strains of music, bodies as powerful as trusting sculptures. Ida Scott? Amanda Wingfield. We missed you at the DAR meeting. I said I've had her sinuses are acting up. How are your sinuses? Pause. You're a Christian martyr, honey. That's what you are. You're a Christian mom. Well, look, I just noticed that your subscription to the Companion's about to expire. Oh, yes, honey, with the next issue. Just when that brand new cereal is coming out by Bessie Mae Harper. Remember when Gone with the Wind came out and how it took everyone by storm and you just couldn't go out if you hadn't read it. It's all about Scarlet. You had to know about Scarlet. Well, the critics are already comparing this to Gone with the Wind. They call it the Gone with the Wind for the post-World War generation. What? Burning? Oh, honey, don't let it burn. Go check the oven. I'll wait on the water. I think she hung up. <laughs> Yes. 
Lawrence, I do not control the output of diseased minds or those that came to them. But I will not tolerate such filth to be brought into my house. No, 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 no. House. House? Who pays rent on it? Who makes a slave of himself? Don't you No, do it. no, no. I must have made things. Not you listen to me. I don't me. want to hear any more. You come back here. You will hear more. No, I won't hear more. I'm going out. You come back in. Out, out, out. Of... Come back in here, Tommy. Look, I'm not through talking to you. Oh, go to. Oh. <laughs> You're going to listen to me. No more insolence from you. I'm at the end of my patience. Where do you think I'm at? Aren't I supposed to have any patience reach the end of mother? I know. I know. It seems unimportant what I'm doing, what I want to do, having a little difference between them. You don't think that. I think that you're doing things you're ashamed of. And that's why you act like this. No one goes to the movies every night. No one goes to the movies night after night. No one goes to the movies as much as you pretend to. People don't go to the movies at midnight. And movies don't let out at nearly 2 a.m. You come in stumbling, muttering to yourself like a maniac. Then you get three hours sleep, go to work, Oh, I can picture what's going down there, all that moping and doping, because you're in no condition. No, I'm in no condition. What right do you have to jeopardize your job? Jeopardize the security of us all. What would happen? Listen! You think I'm crazy about the warehouse? You think I'm in love with the continental shoemakers? You think I want to spend 55 years down there in that solitex interior with press and tubes? Look, I'd rather somebody picked up a crowbar and bat out my brains than go back morning. I go. Every time you come in here on that goddamn rise and shine, rise and shine, I say to myself how lucky dead people are. But I get up. I go. For $65 a month, I give up all that I dream of doing and being happy. And you say self. Self's all I ever think of? Why, listen, if self is what I thought of, mother, I'd be where he is. Gone. As far as the system of transportation reaches, where are you going? Right? I'm going to movies. I don't believe that law. I'm going to opium dens. Yes, opium dens. Dens of vice and criminal hangouts, mother. I'm joining the Hogan gang. I'm a hard assassin. Carry a Tommy gun in a violin case. Run a whole street of cat houses in the valley. They call me Killer. Killer Wingfield. <laughs> I mean a double life. Simple, honest warehouse worker by day. By night, a dynamic star of the underworld, mother. I go to gambling casinos, spin away fortunes on the roulette table. I wear a patch over one eye and a false mustache. Sometimes I put on green whiskers. On those occasions, they call me El Diablo. <laughs> I can tell you many things, many things to make you sleepless. My enemies plan to dynamite this place. They're going to vault off sky high some night. I'll be glad, very happy. And so will you. You'll go up, up on a broomstick over a blue mountain with Seventeen gentlemen callers, you ugly, battling old brats! I will speak to you until you apologize! and it all falls through. Tom, Tom, what are you doing? Looking for a door key. Where have you been all this time? I've, I've been to the movies. All this time at the movies? <coughs> there, was, there was a very long program. There was a Garbo picture, and a Mickey Mouse, and a travel log, and a newsreel, and a preview of coming attractions. And there was an organ solo, and a collection for the milk fund, simultaneously, which ended up in this terrible fight between a fat lady and an usher. Did you have to stay through everything? Oh, of course. Oh, I almost forgot. There was a big stage show. The headliner of this stage show was Malvolio the Magician. He performed wonderful tricks, many of them, such as 
pouring water back and forth between pitches. First it turned to wine, and then it turned to beer, and then it turned to whiskey. I know it was whiskey it finally turned into because he needed someone to come up out of the audience to help him, and I came up, both shows. <sighs> Kentucky straight bourbon. Very generous fellow. <laughs> he gave souvenirs. <laughs> he gave me this. This is his magic scarf for You can have it. You wave this over a canary cage, and you get a bowl of goldfish. You wave it over the goldfish bowl, and they fly away canaries. But the wonderfulest trick of them all is the coffin trick. We nailed him into a coffin. He got out of the coffin without removing one nail. Here's a chick that come in handy for me. Get me out of this two by four situation. Tom, what are you shushing for? You wake up mother. Hey, hey. Hey, back for all those. Rise and shine! You know, they don't take much intelligence to get yourself into the nail of a coffin tomorrow. But who in the hell ever got to come out of one without moving one nail? started not speaking. If you just say you're sorry, she'll start speaking again. Her not speaking? That's such a tragedy. <laughs> please, please. Laura, are you going to do what I asked you to do, or do I have to get dressed to go out myself? Going, going, as soon as I get on my coat. Butter and what else? Just butter. Tell them to charge. Oh, Mother, they make such faces when I do that. Sticks and stones could break our bones, but the look on Mr. Garfinkel's face won't harm us. Now your brother, his coffee's getting cold. Do what I asked you, will you, Tom? Will you? Laura, go now or just don't go at all. Going, going! Laura! No, I'm all right. I just slipped, but I'm all right. If anyone gets injured on that fire escape land, then the landlord should be sued for every penny he possesses. 